Joel tonight, and I'm going to start there and I'm going to leave you guessing, at least at the beginning, okay? In Joel, what I'm going to preach to you tonight is a perfect example of what the prophet Joel says, so amen. In Joel chapter 2 and 25, God speaking through the prophet Joel, the prophet of revival. He is the prophet of revival. He is the prophet of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. And of course, the people have gone through a time of famine and Locusts have attacked their land, but the Bible tells us in verse 25 of chapter 2, God says, And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army which I sent among you. Now you remember Brother Yates said uh, that these different uh, stages in the locust gives us a picture of some eat the leaves, some eat the bark off the tree, some eat the roots, so on and so forth. But God said that He would restore those years. Amen. Amen. That the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palm worm, my great army. How many of y'all believe that God can restore? <laughs> I said, I believe that God can restore. Now, as an example of that, let's go over to the book of Ruth. Amen. Beautiful example of the restoration power of the Lord God is found in the book of Ruth. Let's look at chapter 1, please, again. We finish chapter 1. We'll look at chapter 2 tonight by the grace of God. How many of y'all going to help me preach? We're going to back up just a little bit and get some of you caught up, okay? And I'm not going to re-preach the message to you, but sort of give you an idea of what we covered this morning. And then go into chapter 2. You see the great restoration power of a living Lord. Now, before I preach to you tonight the Word of God, how many believe that when you leave, you're going to have spiritual victory? Did you come here for victory? <laughs> will, will you leave here tonight with spiritual victory? Okay. If you came here seeking victory in your life, then you will leave tonight with that. If you came here tonight expecting nothing, you will leave here with that. I cannot give you your own personal victory. You're going to have to go and get it for yourself. Uh, you with me here? Expectation of an exalted Jesus, listen, creates results. Say it with me. Expectation of an exalted Jesus creates results. If you come in here and you have an expectation and you will exalt Him, it will create results in your life. So it all depends on you. I-A-D-O-U. It all depends on you, an old military thing. As to whether or not you come here tonight, get your victory and leave with victory. It's not on me, it's on you. Okay? How many of y'all expect victory tonight? You're going to leave with a victory, right? Let me see again. How many over here? How many over here? How many over here? Woo, man, we almost have the whole church participating. Mm, praise the Lord. Look at your neighbor and say, "Create the expectation creates results. God can do anything. Now give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Chapter 1 of the book of Ruth, verse 19. What a great, just a wonderful book. I love the book of Ruth. 
have preached from it many, many, many times. I love the book of Ruth. In chapter 1 and verse 19, So they too went until they came to Bethlehem, the house of bread, and it came to pass, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all, say all, all. the city was moved about them, and they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord hath testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. And Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabitess said unto Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him, in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, Go, my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her hap. <coughs> Say her hap. H-A-P. Her hap was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz, who was of the kindred of Elimelech. Let's pray. Father, we come before You right now. We give You all praise and all glory and all honor. We cast down every vain imagination and every high thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of Christ. Lord, we take captive, God, right now every thought that would impede Your work among us in Jesus' mighty name. We give You all the praise and all the glory. Amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. This morning we began to preach to you from this beautiful book called the book of Ruth. It is the story of the kinsman redeemer, the Hebrew word Goel. We'll get into that in just a little bit. But the Bible tells us the background or the timing of it was during the time of the judges. It is a picture prophetically of the Christendom as a whole in its failure. <clears throat> during that time, God struck the land of Israel with a famine. There was a family that happened to live there. The Bible tells us their name. The name of the father was Elimelech. My God is my king. His wife's name was Na his wife's name was Naomi, which means pleasant or sweet. They had two sons, Milan, which means puny or weak, and Kilion or Chilion, however you want to say it, which means pining they were sick and so the scripture tells us they lived in the place called Bethlehem Judah the house of bread and praise something happened in that little family what was it that took place what caused them to name their children with such names of sickness and weakness they became cold and indifferent to the things of God. And as a result of that, the mother and the father, Elimelech and Naomi, became sick and weak spiritually. And the Bible says a crisis hit them, hit their land. It's called the famine. Instead of staying put in the place that God had given to His people, the land of Canaan, the place for the people of God, they decided to leave the will of God and to go into Moab, a land of idols, a land that had the curse of God upon it, a land of immorality, a land full of unbelievers, a land that did not have a promise connected to it whatsoever. Basically, what they did was they backslid in a time of crisis. But before they did that, they had become cold and indifferent to the things of God. 
Bible says they went over to Moab. And the Scripture tells us things begin to fall apart on them. One thing after another. It didn't turn out like they hoped. They had only planned on going over to Moab for just a little period of time and then they were going to go back home to Bethlehem, Judah. But the Scripture tells us they lingered there for ten long years. And Moab, the world, upon the backslider began to take place. The effects of that decision that they had made began to take its toll. Let me say something to you brothers and sisters that I did not say this morning. Your destiny does not depend upon the circumstances that come in your life. Your destiny is determined by the decisions that you make in life. If you are the kind of person that lets circumstance control your future and determine your destiny, you have missed, missed really what it's all about. Don't look at circumstances and say, okay, I'm in this situation. That's going to make me who I am. No, you have to understand today the decisions that I make and the decisions that you make determine your destiny right now. You need to get a hold of that. You've got to get a hold of that. Because if you don't, you go through life and think of yourself as a victim. You'll begin to look at yourself as a victim. And you'll start saying, poor me, why is this happening to me? Why, why is this going on? I deserve something better than that. And if you're not careful, you'll let all of these circumstances come against your life and determine your destiny. No, I'm telling you, it's not circumstance that determines destiny. It's the choices that you make. And everybody in this church tonight, including this pastor, you're making decisions and you're making choices that are going to determine your future and your destiny. And after you make those decisions and those determinations and those choices, you may want to look back and you may want to blame this and blame that and blame the circumstances. But I'm going to tell you something, that is not the truth. What got us where we are today is decisions that we make. What's going to get you where you are tomorrow is the decisions that you make. Not the circumstances. Not how you let life control you. Not how you let people dictate to you your emotions. It's the decisions that you make. Are y'all here with me tonight? And so this little family made a decision to leave the place of blessing and to get out of the will of God and to go over to Moab. The Bible tells us the sad, sad outcome of that decision. It is prophetic of anybody and everybody who makes that choice. If I make the choice that they made, the very same thing in some manner, some form or fashion will come to me. If you make these decisions that they made to leave God, to get out of the will of God, then the same thing in some manner, some form will happen to you. The Bible tells us they were looking for life, but they didn't get life. Because Jesus says something very unique. He says, except you lose your life for my sake. If you don't lose your life for His sake, if you're not willing to give your life for Jesus' sake, then you're going to eventually lose your life. You see, here's the point. is when you and I are willing to give up God to try to pursue what we want. If we try to pursue a life without God, we're not going to experience the life we're looking for. We're going to experience death. That's just the way it is. Because without God in your life, you'll always end up in failure. Hallelujah. So it's important to make the right decisions. So the Bible tells us they tried to pursue life outside of the will of God. They tried to find life in Moab, but instead of life, they got death. They should have stayed there in that time of famine. They should refuse to let anything move them out of that place, out of the will of God. But they didn't. And the Bible says it wasn't too long that Elimelech, the daddy, the fell daddy in this story, he died. He died. He never made it back to the church. He never made it back to the promised land. He died in a foreign land of idols.
They took and they buried him on a mountain in Moab with tears streaming down their face, full of sadness and full of heartbreak. It did not work out like they thought. Instead of it bringing life to them, it brought death to them. And then the Scripture tells us another tragedy. And that was the two sons of Elimelech and Naomi took to themselves wives of Moab. They didn't wait on God to give them a wife. They took a wife that they wanted. And the Bible tells us absolutely that was forbidden by God that they were not to take a wife of the world, not to take a Moabite woman, but they did it anyway. And with time, we not only have one funeral service for the daddy, but now we have two funeral services because these two boys die in Moab. And so now they take these two sons and they place them beside their daddy in Moab and have a funeral service and tears are running down all of their face now. Instead of life, it brought death. When you study a little bit, you kind of wonder... You say, well, what caused these young men, these sons to die before their mother? They died young. They died, if you will, prematurely. What was it that that caused the fatality of these two young men? And right before I came out here to preach to you, I was spending a little time in study and research. And Jewish writers say this, that because they married an unbeliever in Moab, Jewish writers say it was a divine judgment from God Almighty that the fatalities of those two boys came as a result of God's judgment falling upon them for marrying an unbeliever. That's what the Jews believed. It didn't just happen. It was God Himself judging the decisions that they make. I want to tell you something tonight. You need to have a healthy fear of God. I need to have a healthy fear of God, a reverence and a respect for God to think that I can live in a life of sin. And it produced life to me. It's not, it's not reality. It'll always produce death. And in some cases, divine judgment from God Almighty Himself will fall because the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. It doesn't say the wages of sin is life. It says the wages of sin is death. And I know some of you have been in the church a long time and you've heard this preacher preach for a long time, but the Word of God is still true today. The wages of sin is death. And Jewish scholars say the reason why these young men died at an early age was because they sinned against God Almighty and married unbelievers. And so now, the sorrow has increased. And the Bible tells us Naomi, at this point in her life, full of bitterness, full of regret, full of disappointment. She hears some messenger comes through with that God has provided bread back in Judah. That God had visited His people and has given them bread. When she heard that, she's now a widow. She doesn't have money. She's basically poor. She's lost everything. She's lost her love. She's lost her children. She's lost her money. She's broke. She's bankrupt. She's bitter. And the Bible tells us in that condition that she makes a decision, I'm going back home. Good decision, Naomi. You're going to go back home. She makes that decision. She tells her two daughter-in-laws that she's going to do this. You know the story. Orpah and Ruth go a little ways with her. And the Bible says that Orpah changed her mind and went back to her false gods and to Moab. The tone of voice for the unbeliever, Naomi, she actually encouraged Orpah to depart from the right path. That's what happens when somebody backslides. They start encouraging people. Oh, don't go that path. It's too straight. It's too strict. It's too narrow. You see, that's what happens when the backslider starts talking. And so, Orpah took the advice of her mother-in-law because obviously that's what she wanted. 
She wanted that advice to leave. And the Bible says she turned and she showed the back of her neck to her mother-in-law and went straight back to her idols. And we never hear her ever again. Never do we hear of her in the Bible ever again. Because evidently she died and she was lost. Unless there's some kind of extra biblical writing concerning Orpah that gives us the history of her life, the Bible doesn't tell us that she was ever saved. When she took the advice of her mother-in-law and went back to Moab, she died in Moab, as far as I know by the Word of God, and she was lost. So now... If I understand the God of covenant correctly and I understand the Word of God correctly, we got Elimelech. He's died and he's lost. We've got Kilion. He died and he's lost. We've got Milan. He died and he was lost. They didn't make it back to the church. And we've got now a woman, Orpah, who was the daughter-in-law of Naomi. She will go back and stay lost in Moab hoping for a Moabite husband to give her rest, which means to marry her, she would never find satisfaction for the rest of her life. But there was one. Her name was Ruth. And Naomi tried to get Ruth also to join her sister-in-law, tried to get her to join her and going back to her people. You know the story. But the Bible says Ruth Cleave. Ruth would not go back. Ruth made up her mind. The Bible says she was steadfast in her mind. She says, I'm going with you. I'm not going back to those idols. I'm making a decision tonight. Is it idols or God? Is it God's or is it God? And Ruth said, I'm going to make a decision to serve God. The Bible said she had a steadfast mind. She clave to the Lord. You gotta make up your mind tonight. Every day of your life, you gotta make up your mind. I'm gonna serve God. I'm not looking for an exit to get off this highway. I'm gonna stay on this highway. I'm gonna stay in the church. I'm gonna live for God. Even if a famine comes because I'm out of the will of God, I'm gonna stay there until things get better. Ruth said, this Moabite, this Gentile, now becomes a seeker of Jehovah, a seeker of Yahweh. When God's people were indifferent and cold and didn't want to seek Him, there was a Gentile that says, I want this Jesus. I want this kinsman redeemer. Even if you Jews don't want Him, I want Him. And as a result, the curse that was placed upon them, God by grace came alongside His law. And He says, because you seek Me, because you want Me, you will find Me. And I'll make a way for you to be in my congregation. She looked at her daughter-in-law. I mean, Ruth looked at her mother-in-law and said this. She says, where you go, I'll go. Where you lodge, I'll lodge. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. And where you die, I will die and be buried. And if I don't do this, so do to God unto me as I have just spoken. She said, I'm telling you, I'm making a commitment to you. Ruth said, I'm making a commitment to you, Naomi. See, we got a lot of people that don't want to make a commitment. She said, I'm going to do all these things, but if I don't do them, God do unto me what I've just said. We need some people that will open their mouth and say, I'm making a commitment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's too many people that are undecided. You don't know where they stand right now in this hour. It's time for you to start opening your mouth and begin to declare, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to stand firm. I'm going to live for God. I've got my mind made up. I am not going to live the life of a backslider and have the bitter results of a backslider. She made up her mind. And the Bible says that Naomi and Ruth made their way to Bethlehem, Judah. Good decision. Good decision, Naomi, to go back home. Good decision to go back to church. Good decision to go back to the time when you used to dance. 
good decision to go back to the time when you used to pray good decision to go back to the time when you used to worship God in spirit and truth good decision to go back to the house that's got bread in it good decision to get back to the church house good decision because when you make that decision things are going to begin to turn for you instead of one failure after another God is going to intervene and by His divine providence, He's going to begin to take control of the circumstances of your life and make them fall out to a blessing for you. Give God praise in this house. But the Bible tells us that she makes her way back to Bethlehem. It took me about two hours to preach what I just preached to you in about 15 this morning, but I'm going to just give it to you in a nutshell. She comes back to Bethlehem, her old hometown. She doesn't come with a husband, and she doesn't come with children. She's by herself, except for her daughter-in-law. That's it. She doesn't have grandchildren by her side as she walks into Bethlehem because her boys were sterile. Even though they were Ephrathites, which means doubly fruitful, they were sterile. When you and I get out of the will of God, we become sterile in our productivity for God. She didn't have any grandbabies because there was sterility flash all over her life. No grandbabies coming home with her. Only her without her husband, and without her sons. They're dead, buried on a mountainside in Moab. Right, amen. And as far as I know, and most commentators will state this, they died in apostasy. Because Naomi will later say, you were kind to the dead. And you were kind to the living. See, even Naomi knew that when her husband died, he died out of the will of God. Even Naomi knew that when they buried him, that he was lost. Yeah, you had, you were kind to, to the dead. You were kind to your husband, my son, but they're dead. I don't know where they are. I'm not to judge that, but by the Word of God, based on what I know in the Word of God, those people died and they were lost because they never made it back to God. Amen. Don't do it. Don't get cold. Don't get indifferent. Don't get bitter. You make up your mind tonight. I'm going to get the victory over whatever is ailing me, whatever is causing me and hindering me to serve God with all of my heart. I'm going to get the fire back. I'm going to get white hot, a white hot temperature for God in my life. Because I don't want the failure of a backslider. Dog in my trail. She came walking into Bethlehem, Judah with Moabite. A, a, a Moabite, and I told you this morning, she was as dark as Brother Jonathan Lemons. She, the Moabite wasn't a Jew. She was a dark-skinned woman. She stood out. But a Gentile. Here she comes. A Gentile. Once an idol worshiper. Once partaker in a land that had no promise out of covenant with God. Here she comes. No hope. She walks in with Naomi. And as soon as they get to church, after ten years of the world's effect upon them, after ten years of backsliding, when she walks into Bethlehem, the Bible says that all the city, not just part of them, but all the city said, is that Naomi? See, she had so changed. Naomi wasn't the same woman that she was in times past. Something had happened in this woman's heart so that when she came back to the church house, the people couldn't even recognize her. Her condition had altered. She had changed. She wasn't the same woman that she used to be. God help every one of us tonight because it can happen to me and it can happen to you. 
One moment you can be in a place where God is your king. You're in the will of God. You're serving God. You're in Bethlehem, Judah, the house of bread and praise. And everything's going good. The blessings of God are upon you. You're in the land of Canaan, the land of holiness and provision. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, coldness and indifference will grip your heart. And before you know it, you can enter that world. And when you come back, thank God, you might make it back. But when you do, we might not be able to recognize you. Because you will have so been altered. Your condition will have so changed that we won't even recognize you for what you used to be. If I can't recognize you tonight, I pray it's because the glory of God is upon you. Not because we have drifted away from God. Hallelujah. If I can't recognize this church, let it because we are growing in the things of God. Not because we have backslidden from Him. We should be getting better with time. Not bitter with time. If you want to know what your life will look like going away from God, it is written for you in advance in this prophecy called the book of Ruth. The loss that we will experience. The marrying off of our children to people in the world. The bitterness and disappointment, the broken condition that we will find ourselves in. So much so. That if we do make it back, if we do, remember three of the four didn't. If we do make it back, we won't even be recognized. You see people in the world living for God. Not just people in the world. I'm going to tell you in the name of the I'm going to preach in the Holy Ghost tonight. You can see people sitting in the church beside you right now. That one time they had a beautiful walk with God. Beautiful humility, beautiful relationship, beautiful spirit. And now you look at him and you think, is that Naomi? Something has changed. Something's different and not for the good. Are y'all here with me? God help you tonight to get the victory before you leave this house. You and I need to pray tonight. God, take me back. Take me back. I need to get back to Bethlehem, the house of bread. Praise. Take me back, God. I repent, Lord Jesus, of my backslidden condition. I repent of my indifference and my coldness before I lose everything. Hallelujah. God, in His grace, will allow you to lose one thing, but not everything. But if you stay in that condition, Amen. which is out of the will of God, Amen. God will say, okay, right, right, you, you, you wouldn't repent. I took that one. You wouldn't repent. So now this one. You wouldn't repent. So now this one. I charge you in the Holy Ghost to get up and get out of Moab. I charge you in the Holy Ghost to get on fire for Jesus Christ. I charge you in the Holy Ghost to get rid of your bitterness. Because if you don't, you're going to bring upon yourself, Amen. on yourself, more misery than you can ever begin to imagine. She walks into the city. Nobody even recognizes her. Is this Naomi and Naomi? What a sad, a sad response. Her response to them was this. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me sweet. Because I'm not sweet anymore. I'm not pleasant anymore. Call me Mara. I'm bitter. Bitterness got a hold of her. Let me tell you something. It's easy to get bitter. I said it's easy to get bitter. Don't call me pleasant. Don't call me sweet. Call me Mara. Because the Lord hath dealt bitterly with me. Amen. Notice she blamed God for everything that had happened to her. She said, God has dealt with me 
very bitterly. No, Naomi, your own sin brought all of this upon you. It wasn't God dealing bitterly with you. It was your decisions in life, your choices in life that got you in a condition where you have all of these consequences and all of these failures because of what you did, not because of what God did. Not because of what Bethlehem Judah did the church. It was you that got you where you are today by your choice, Naomi. Amen. She comes back bitter. I want to tell you something, brothers and sisters. It's easy to get bitter. Sometimes bitterness will try to rise up in all of us. In the name of Jesus, it's not going to happen. Hallelujah. That's right. Amen. Because you'll get to a place where you will become blind if you allow bitterness to take over your heart. Amen, amen. You'll get to a place where you'll start blaming God for everything that's happened to you. And it wasn't God at all. It was Naomi. Is everybody with me here today? All right, say praise the Lord. The next thing we see about her, verse 21, she said, I went out full and the Lord had brought me home again empty. I went out full when I was in the church, when I was in Bethlehem, Judah. I was full. When you're living for God, that's the way it is. You're full of blessings. You're full of the Spirit of God. You're full. Amen, amen. You're satisfied. Amen, amen. But if you leave God, you will always come back empty. Amen, that's right. This is the profile of the prodigal. This is a prodigal woman. We have a prodigal son in the New Testament. She's a prodigal woman. This is the profile of a prodigal. You leave full, but you come back empty. But the only way you're going to make it back is if the Lord brings you back. Because you won't choose to come back on your own. The only way the prodigal would ever make it back to the house of God, it is because God brought them back to the house of God. It is not because one day they woke up and said, oh, I'm going back to church. They could not make that decision if it wasn't for God drawing them by His Spirit to do it. She said, number one, she wanted to make God look out, look like you know something was wrong with God, the way God treated her. Are you all awake today? But in trying to indict God, and blame God, she had to say something of faith. It sort of slipped out of her mouth. I left full, but I came back empty. But she said this, the Lord has brought me back. See, she realized it was God's grace that intervened on her behalf and brought her back to the church house. Hallelujah. Because if it wasn't for God, she'd have never made that decision. That's right. Amen. So in her desire to blame God and to indict God for everything that had happened to her, she had to confess that it was the grace of God that ever brought her back to the church. She said, I left full, but I came back what? Empty. She said, I came back bankrupt. Empty. I was full. I had a family. I had a husband. I had two sons. They're gone. I'm empty of them. I had money. A little bit of money. It's all gone too. She came back bitter and she came back bankrupt. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have anything to do with backsliding. You'll become blind. You'll become bitter. You'll blame God. Blame everybody else for, for the problems that you created for yourself. And in many cases, you'll be bankrupt maybe of relationships. That's right. And maybe even financially. Amen. Amen. And God allowed all of that to happen, but I don't think He was the direct cause. She brought all of this on herself, but refused to admit it. And so the Bible tells us, she said, she goes on and says another thing about the Lord. She said, the Lord hath testified against me. That means, that's, that's a legal term right there. She says, I'm standing in the courtroom of God. And God is blaming me. 
God is testifying against me. What she's saying is this, is that God is bringing my sin to the forefront. That God is blaming me and God is judging me for my sin. You see, she wanted to make God out to be like there's something wrong with God. Instead, of she should have said, I deserve what I'm getting. I deserve what I got. The consequences that have come upon my life, the loss, the emptiness, the bitterness, all that's happened to me is because of what I have done against God and I repent. No, she just says, God keeps on reminding me of my sin. God keeps bringing my sin out to me and and puts it in front of me and testifies against me. But not one time, brothers and sisters, do I ever see hear this woman repent of what she did. This is the voice of a backslider. A backslider who refuses to repent. They will not repent. They will never say that they are wrong about what they have done. And they'll just talk about how, well, my sin just keeps being brought up all the time. God is... Are you kidding me? Just say, I'm wrong in Jesus' name. I need to repent. I ask God to forgive me. I ask the church to forgive me. I ask my pastor to forgive me. I ask everybody I ask everybody to forgive me because I don't want to keep this thing coming to the forefront. But that's what happens. The most part, churches are this way. Churches, people in churches, they do things wrong. They start experiencing bad things. And they want to blame God. And they want to talk about how it's always brought out to them and about Him. It's always talked about. Oh, are you kidding me? Just repent. Look at your neighbor and say, Repent. Ask God to forgive you and God will be merciful and gracious. So now we see not only does she come back bitter, she comes back bankrupt. Now she comes back and says, God is blaming me. That's the way a backslider talks. The Holy Ghost is speaking to this church tonight. The best thing you can do is get in an altar and ask God to forgive you. The best thing that you or I can do is humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. And if I'm right, okay. If I'm wrong, I need to be dealt with. That's right, Pastor. Amen. That's right. But anyway, anyway, I'm going to put it in God's hands and I'm going to make sure that I'm where I'm supposed to be. Hallelujah, Hallelujah. to the Lamb. See, she's so worried about saving face. So she's got to find somebody to blame. Now watch this, the Bible tells us. Not only is she bitter, not only is she bankrupt, and not only is she saying God is blaming her, bringing her, her sin to her knowledge and testifying against her. Then she goes on and takes a real low, low step and she says, El Shaddai has afflicted me. The breasted one, the provider, El Shaddai. God is not a woman, but He is depicted. El Shaddai is depicted as the breasted one, the provider. How is you could say God, the breasted one, who is like a mother that takes care of the children and feeds the children at the breast, nurtures them? How is it that she could bring herself to a place? And say about this loving God that so much cared and nurtured her that she could say, El Shaddai, the Almighty, has afflicted me. No, you're afflicted. Yeah, I listen, brothers and sisters, I do believe in some measure that what she said and in some of these things are partly true. Are you hearing me today? God sometimes does have to break you and I. And the Bible's very clear that He will break you and I at times. He will. And if you don't think He can do it, I'm going to tell you as your pastor, God can break every one of us. He can put us on our face in a heartbeat. And But by the grace of God today, I'm not on my face weeping and crying. Because God is in control of everything. The Almighty has afflicted me. It literally means broken me. You can, you can remember this very carefully. God 
has dealt bitterly with me. She's bitter. She comes back bankrupt. She's empty. She says God's blaming her. God's blaming me. Can you imagine that? And number four, God broke me. That's what she said. And God does at times break us because we need to be broken at times in our life because we are so prideful and so strong-willed and so self-absorbed that sometimes God has to break you, bring the disappointments in your life. Amen. But it comes from the hand of a loving Father who cares about you and wants to get you out of Moab before you die. Most everything that happened to her, she brought upon herself. But she did recognize God in His sovereignty either allowed this or in, in, in some way, some parts of what she said actually brought it to her life. Do you believe the Word of the Lord tonight? Yes, sir. How many of you want a happy life? Yes, sir. How many of you want a bitter, bankrupt life of blame and life of brokenness? You say, Pastor, I'm already there. Amen. The good news is you can get up and you can move from that position and you can keep going and understand, amen, that you don't have to stay in that state that you're in. Because the Bible says as soon as she walks in with Ruth the Moabitess, guess what? It's a barley harvest. Better days are about to take place. <laughs> she took the steps necessary to get back into the will of God where my God is king, said Elimelech. I'm getting back in the center of the will of God. And when you make that decision to get back into the will of God, better days are coming. She showed up at just the right time to have a harvest. She showed up at just the right time to have restoration. God is fixing to do something here. There is no way that this woman can continue to be called Mara. She cannot continue to be called bitter. God, at one time she was called Naomi, and she says, don't call me Naomi anymore, call me bitter Mara. God says, there's no way that I can keep calling you Mara because I'm fixing to change everything and I'm going to bring you back to Naomi. <laughs> From Naomi to Mara. From Mara to Naomi. That's the restoring power of a living God. God can go back in time and history in resurrection power. Hallelujah. And bring back the days of old back to you and replenish you and restore you and resurrect it. He's able to do it. You can't do it, but God can do it. I'll restore it to you to the years of the canker worm, the, the locust, the canker worm, the palmer worm. Have eaten. Only God can back up in time and say, I'm going to bring you back to restoration. I'm not going to leave you in bitterness. I'm going to cause you to be pleasant again. I'm going to cause you to be sweet again. I cannot allow that tag to continue to be on your life because I'm getting ready to change everything because you're showing up at just the right time and that time is the time of barley harvest. Hallelujah. Give God praise in the house. Hallelujah. It's the time. It's April. It's around March and April time. That means we're fixing to move into Calvary territory. We're fixing to move in resurrection ground where God can resurrect or restore people that are dead and make them live. Get ready, Naomi. Things are fixing to change. Look at your neighbor. I'm not just preaching. I feel this in the Holy Ghost. I've been feeling this in the Spirit to tell you that God can restore the years, the canker worm, the palm worm, the locust hath eaten. I believe that this is a word for you today. I, if you don't want it, I'm taking it. Hallelujah. I want it. I want it. Hallelujah. 
And God doesn't just want to take you back to a time when you were pleasant. God wants to make it better. Because the Bible talks about the exceeding greatness of His power to us, Lord, who believe, who believe. You thought He was great yesterday. He's better today than He was yesterday. You, were, you thought He was good ten years ago. He's better today than He was ten years ago. The exceeding greatness of His power to us, though, us were that believe. You can sit there and you can be indifferent and you can be in cold and you can end up like Naomi bitter or you can say no. I'm going to repent. I'm going back home. I'm going to go back to praise. I'm going to get on fire for God. And I'm going to get restored. I'm going to get what I need because God has made a way for me to come into a time of harvest. They came to Bethlehem in the beginning. A barley harvest in chapter 2. She meets the kinsman redeemer. In chapter 2, she meets, if you will, Jesus Christ. By grace and by mercy. Hallelujah. You can make a decision in your life to keep on living the way you've been living. Or you can say, no, I'm not going to stay Mara. I'm not going to stay bitter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be Naomi again. I'm going to get the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Restoration, resurrection power from Jesus Christ. In the beginning of barley harvest brings you to resurrection ground. And you're going to see how God in this next chapter brings about restoration. The Bible begins to tell us that Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. A kinsman. Wow. Somebody that was related to Elimelech, and I don't want to go too long, so I've got to be careful about the timing, because the timing of the message is important, just as important as what had been said. That when they get there, not only is it the barley harvest, but God has a kinsman redeemer waiting for her. Do you understand what a kinsman redeemer is? In the fourth chapter, you will find out that he had the ability to purchase back the land that Naomi had sold to pay off her debts. He could buy that land back and restore it back to the bitter woman. But more importantly, he could marry Ruth and raise up children to Abimelech. Abimelech is dead on a hillside in Moab in a grave. Those two boys are dead on a hillside in Moab in a grave with no children. But God says through a kinsman redeemer, I'm going to bring resurrection life and restoration through a kinsman redeemer. I'm going to cause that which was lost to be restored back. I'm going to restore the land back. And then this man is going to marry this Gentile bride and raise up seed. To Elimelech. Awesome. Hallelujah. Amen. What a mighty God. And so the Bible says his name is Boaz. He's a kinsman of her, of her husband. Not an angel. Because an angel can't be a kinsman redeemer. An angel can't buy you. An angel can't redeem you because an angel doesn't have blood. It has to be a kinsman redeemer. Bone of your bones and flesh of your flesh. It'll have to be the God-man, Jesus Christ. Deity and humanity wrapped up in one come to this earth to redeem you. An angel can't redeem me. It's going to have to be the God-man, my kinsman redeemer according to the flesh that'll come and die for me on that cross and shed His blood. Not an angel. An angel doesn't have the power of the blood to do that. And so He has to be of us. Bone of our bones and flesh of our flesh. And the Bible says that this man was a mighty man of wealth. A kinsman redeemer is also required to be powerful or strong. A kinsman redeemer is required to be very wealthy. This man is wealthy. It costs a lot to redeem you. 
to save you from your sin. It costs a lot to restore you tonight. Don't take this lightly when you come into this house. Yes, I know you're saved. I know you claim to be a born again believer. But do you understand that there's an ongoing process of salvation that's taking place? Don't take it lightly what it takes God tonight to restore you. Don't you dare take this lightly. It cost Him everything. It cost Him His precious blood in order to save you that's why this kinsman had to be strong, powerful, and he had to be very wealthy because it takes a lot to redeem. He had to be willing. There's, we'll see in the story a man, he wasn't willing, amen, to redeem it. Took off his shoe and gave, said, I'm not willing to, to redeem it. He has to be willing. Jesus Christ, He didn't have to. He didn't have to come into this world and die, but He was willing to come as a kinsman redeemer and shed His blood to redeem us from our sins. I don't take this lightly what I'm preaching to you tonight, and I pray to God you're not taking it lightly. It cost Him everything to redeem us, but He was willing to do it. And the Bible says His name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said unto Naomi, Let me go. And you'll see this three times in this chapter. She'll say, let me go. Let me go. I love, I love Ruth. I love her. A Gentile bride. A Gentile woman. Doesn't even know what's coming. Doesn't even know what the future holds for her. Just know that she made up her mind to follow Naomi back to Bethlehem, Judah. She said, your people are going to be my people. Your God's going to be my God. I said it this morning that you can't say God is your God and then say, but I don't want God's people. It don't work that way. When you say God will be my God, you also have to say God's people will be my people. Holy God! Holy people for me! What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Hallelujah to the Lamb! Hallelujah! I can say, I want God, but I don't want you. It don't work that way. He said, I want God and I want the people That's of God. Right. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. That's right, Pastor. That's Before you and I get all, you know, high and mighty and self righteous and think we're better than somebody, think we're better than the person next to us, I think you need a check. That's right. Hallelujah. Let me just tell you this way you need a check up from the neck up. That's right. Amen. Because there ain't nobody better than anybody else in this church. Hallelujah. Everybody in this church needed a kinsman redeemer. Everybody in this church, when you come to the cross, it's level ground for everybody. There's no big eyes and little U's in this church. Everybody needs Jesus just as bad as the next person. You sit there all high and mighty, think you're more important than anybody else. No, 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 my friend. We, it's level at the foot of the cross. We all need Jesus Christ in our life. And she looks at her mother-in-law with such respect and humility. She says, let me go. I don't know where I'm going. I'm a Moabite in a strange land. But let me go. I recognize we have a need. I can see the cupboards are bare. Can anybody relate? I open the refrigerator door and there's nothing in there. Can anybody relate? So she says, let me go. And when I go, let me glean. She didn't say, I'm looking for somebody to hand out, give me something. She didn't say, I'm looking for somebody to hand. God made a provision for the poor to have gleanings that were left in the fields. Things that were left behind the poor and the widows. Deuteronomy 24, read it. They could go and gather what was left behind called the gleanings. God made provision for the poor that way. But they had to get up and go get it. Amen, amen. That's awesome. Amen. Amen. God didn't say, okay, you're poor. We're, we're, we're bringing it to your house today. No, God says, if you're hungry and you've got empty cupboards and empty, Jesus name, an empty refrigerator, then you need to get up and God has made a provision for you and you're going to have to go out there and get the provision that God made for you.
let me go. She sees the need, so she makes herself industrious and gets busy serving. And the Bible tells us, let me go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go my daughter. And she went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers and her hap, say her hap, was to light on a part of the field belonging unto Boaz who was the kindred of Elimelech. She just happened to go to the kinsman redeemer's field. It just, she just, it just hap, say hap. But when it happened for her, it happened. What does the word hap mean? Well, some people look at it and they say by chance. She was just going along. She always didn't know where she was going. She just by chance showed up. And there's just by chance or by luck, good luck, she showed up in the field of Boaz. Not for the believer. There is no such thing, Sister Adele, as chance or luck for the believer. When it says she happed, that means by divine providence. What that means is that God was behind the scenes controlling all the circumstances that would bring her to that place that happened to be Boaz. This doesn't happen for the unbeliever. Amen, amen. God is not sovereignly, providentially working in the unbelievers' lives, right, right, right. working circumstances to create blessing for them. In their life, because they're living in disobedience to His will, it becomes a destructive power and destructive force that everything that they touch, the sin that's in their life, creates death. Everything falls apart like the first chapter. But when a person is in the will of God, hap happens. When a person is in the will of God, God will literally, tomorrow when you go to work, He will have already worked your day out ahead of time. There will be somebody think about, I'm going to go buy a car at Toyota. And they're going to drive up at just the moment that you... He said, that, that was good. The boss says, that bad. That, you, you sure are a lucky guy, Brother Jonathan. No, Hap. Amen. Hap. Amen. What do you mean, Hap? Yes, sir. Amen. God orchestrated it. Amen. He brought this person to drive up just as I was walking out the door. Hallelujah. On, Somebody said, Amen. Amen. Or in the case, Sister Christina this morning got up and testified, and she was talking about how, in some cases, it takes literally months in order for a, a person to come, uh, for a doctor to come and to attend somebody that's got a heart failure. Months before an appointment can even be made. But hap. Yeah, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, that's it. Sister Victoria just haps to work at Dr. Lively's office. And there ha just happens to be a woman named Chrissy there that's a nurse practitioner that can get my mother-in-law into a doctor that day. Just hap. Just hap. Just hap. After the funeral service, just hap. That me and Christina say, we better go see Grandma and see how she's doing. Just hap. Just hap to sit down and say, you need to get to a doctor because she's real stubborn. She don't want to do that. You know. Just hap, you know. Every, what I'm saying is that everything fell into place. And they took her to the doctor. And the doctor said, you get her straight into the hospital right now. Are y'all hearing what I'm telling you? If that didn't happen by hap, she might not have made it. But God, God works to... God in His restoration power, in His resurrection power, is behind the scenes. 
circumstances to happen just the way they happen. She just had to go to that field. And so they put my my mother-in-law in the hospital. Amen. On Tuesday. And she got out on Friday. Somebody said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The Bible says God calls us. He makes all. He makes, hallelujah, makes everything to work together for the good. For who? Those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. He doesn't make all things work together for the unbeliever for the good. But if you're a believer and you love Him and you're called according to His purpose, He's behind the scenes making the hap happen. He knows the thoughts that He has towards you. He knows the thoughts that He has towards me. Thoughts of good and not thoughts of evil to bring us to an expected end. This is a promise that we have from a God who can come and resurrect dead situations who can bring life to people when it looks like they're going to die I'm telling you that's the kind of God that you serve tomorrow when you get up you come in contact with certain people God will let you know this wasn't by accident that's right God's working for you. He's behind the scenes. God cares about you. God loves you. Yeah, you may be through a time of bitterness and all of these things, but God says it's harvest time. It's resurrection time. It's a time to meet your kinsman redeemer. It's a time to meet Jesus in the field. It's a time to understand that God's getting ready to bless you. It's a time to understand that God's getting ready to leave some handfuls on purpose. It's a time when your provision, your bread, your water, all kinds of blessing are going to come back to you. It's a time like that. And you're going to think it was luck or just by chance. And God said, no. I made it happen. Somebody give God some praise in this house. That's a promise that He's made to a believer. She didn't deserve it. Naomi didn't deserve it. I don't deserve it. But God makes the lines fall out. For his people in good places. I don't know what it looks like for you right now, but you need to believe I'm walking out of this church tonight with victory. And I may not see my full reward tomorrow. I may not see it a week from day or a month from today. I may not even see it a year from now. But I know that my God at some point is not only going to bless my life, but He's going to bring a full reward. I, I know that my God is not only going to allow me to have the leanings in the field, but just like Boaz said in that second chapter, he said, leave some handfuls on purpose. Hallelujah. God said, I already know what your future looks like. I've already got your provision already ready for you. I'm going to leave handfuls on purpose. I'm going to make your hap happen. When she went to the field, God made the hap happen. When she met Moaz, He made the hap happen. <coughs> the Bible tells us a beautiful story. Through a process of time, she comes to meet him. Boaz goes to the field and he tells his reapers, said, the Lord be with you. He's always blessing those that work for him. He's inspecting the fields. He's instructing them to take care. Oh, she, by the way, catches his eye. Just happened. Ruth just happened to catch his eye. Boaz goes, whoo, what was that? I mean, yeah, she was beautiful. Boy, whew, what is that? What is that? What is that? What did I just see? Hallelujah. So he inquires of her. He said, where she see? You know, he doesn't want to go just by what he sees. He don't want to go just by beauty. He says, I got to find out who she is. I got to find out where she came from. And it was told to him the story. 
she made a decision to leave her mother and her father. She made a decision to leave Moab. To leave the people of Moab. To leave her false gods. She made a decision in life that everybody would have told her it's crazy. It's crazy for you to do that. It's crazy for you to give all this up and go with this woman, this widow woman, to a place called Bethlehem. But she was willing to leave it all and give it all up. And this was rehearsed to Boaz. She came here. She made God's people her people and God her God. And he says, all right, she's not only pretty, but she's got good character. And I'm going to take care of her. And I'm, he said, I'm going to make it happen for her. Hallelujah. All this came together. And she got so blessed that she gathered up an ephah of barley. The barley of the poor. The barley of resurrection. And then later on, handfuls on purpose, take you all the way over to Pentecost. She gathered that all up. And she went home to Nahomi. And she reported to Naomi. Where you been, Ruth? Well, I just had. What you carrying, Ruth? I just had. An ephod of barley would feed ten people. She didn't just have enough for herself. She had enough to feed ten people in one day. That's how blessed she was. And guess what? Naomi got to participate in all of that. She got to experience all of these blessings and all of these provisions. God brought restoration to Mara and called her Naomi again. Because that is the kind of God that you and I serve. Is a God of abundance, a God of blessing, a God who can't wait to orchestrate the things in your life that the hats the haps. Look at your name and say the haps are going to turn into happenings. Brother, it just happened. It just happened. It just happened. When you go over there, they say, how did it happen? Just say, it just, how did it happen? It just happened. God's divine providence. <laughs> Pastor nudging me a little bit. No, not really. I don't want to take the blame for this. But that's the way God is. He's looking for a way to bring a hap in your life. Divine providence. To restore to you the years the canker worm, the palmer worm, the locust hath eaten. God can do that. He can turn it all around. And no matter how bad it's been, no matter how bitter, how broken, and how bankrupt, when you show up at the right time, harvest time, the testimony that she heard while she was in Moab, God is visiting His people with bread. When she walked back to Bethlehem, Judah, now she saw the manifestation of the Word that was given to her. She could see it with her eyes. It's true. Look at what God has done. I, I could have avoided a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, a lot of agony, a lot of disappointment, a lot of bitterness. I could have avoided all of that if I had just stayed But Naomi said, I'm back. Because I serve a God that can go back into time and take the worst situation and reverse it. And restoration literally means resurrect it. He said, I can make dead things come alive again if you'll just believe. Hallelujah. Say praise the Lord. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Your pastor doesn't have the final word. God does. Amen, amen. You hear what I'm telling you? Sometimes God will give you that first word, but then He'll give you another word. He gives you the first word to see if you're willing to slay your Isaac, to test your faith. And then when He finds out you're willing to go that far with Him, then He'll say, 
do the lad no harm. The second word will come. A lot of times we kill our Isaacs, we kill our promises because we fail to hear the second word, the proceeding word that comes out of the mouth of God. I'm telling you today, you, your destiny is not determined by circumstances. It's determined by the decisions that you make when you hear the word of God. You've got praise in the house. Look at your neighbor and say, God has the final word. I've had some disappointments in my life. But that's okay. Because God's using it to position me for a happening. When you leave the church house tonight, you're going to leave in victory. Every one of you here, as far as I know, lifted your hand and said, I'm leaving with victory tonight. The expectation of an exalted Jesus creates results. I expected Him to do something not, and He did. When you leave tonight, when you get up in the morning, there's going to be people that are going to come your way. They're going to cross paths with you. Be careful that you entertain them. Because many have entertained angels unawares. But also be aware that there may be some that will come your way that you will entertain. And they might be demons unaware. So ask God to control your steps. When you get up in the morning, Lord, control my steps, lead my steps. Hallelujah. Make my lines fall into good places. Amen. I'm looking for good things to happen. I'm looking for blessing. I'm, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. When you go home tonight, I dare some of you to walk into your church and preach this. Amen. If you believe God, you will. I believe my Jesus. I believe my Jesus. Now, I could, I could keep preaching the whole chapter, but I'm not because the Holy Ghost told me to stop. So, will you stand? Amen. I'll teach you. I'll show it to you next Sunday morning, God willing, in detail. Hallelujah. I'm encouraged tonight because of the God that I serve. There's nobody like my kinsman redeemer. I think about even before I got saved, the steps, people coming into my life with the truth. Pastor Dan Smelser coming into my life, teaching me a Bible study, then dropping a track on the rapture in my, my mailbox that scared me half to death. God gave me a dream that I missed the rapture of the church. I told him I want to be baptized in water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I happened to get baptized the night that my friend went with me. My friend said, I'm not ready. That night I made a decision. I've been living for the Lord by His grace for over 30 years. That friend of mine that said no that night to this day is still not living for the Lord. And that was over 30 years ago. God orchestrated events, dreams, people, connections to bring about your salvation. Do you think now that you're in the church that God is going to be done with you and be finished with you and no longer work on your behalf? No, He that has begun a good work in you shall complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He's not through with me. He's not through with this church. Don't listen to the gainsayers. Don't listen to the lies. God is a God of restoration. He's going to make the hat happen. And I was thinking about it. went to that funeral. And we just happened to drive up a little bit before Pastor Dan Smelser. Just happened to and I'm just, I could go on and on and on about all those things that happened in that funeral. God orchestrated it every step of the way. Because that's the kind of God He is. 
And I give honor where honor's due. If it wasn't for Him, I wouldn't be here in the church. If it wasn't for Him, she wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Him, you wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for Him, nobody would be here. Give God some praise in this house. Because God, by His divine providence, was behind the scenes working everything out for the good to raise me from the dead and to raise you from the dead. So don't sit around and think about, well, who am I going to marry? Oh, I'm so worried. Who am I going to marry? There's nobody here. I look around. You say nobody's here and the church is full. There ain't nobody here for me. And oh, you're all worried about it. Don't you know that your sovereign God is in control of your future? I remember the first Thomas Preto got in a church. He's driving an old welding truck. I mean, that thing was a clunker. Sorry, brother. I know that's your baby. But it's a clunker, man. You know? Hallelujah. Now look at him drive a big old fancy. Big old fancy ram. Sitting up on his throne. But it just all happened, didn't it? It just it was all chance and all good luck, right? No. God. It, there's no such thing as chance and good luck in God. If you've got the favor of God, there's a reason why you have the favor of God. If you've got the blessings of God in your life, there's a reason why you got the blessings of God. Amen. Say praise the Lord, church. He's behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about who you're going to marry. You don't have to worry about your grandkids. You don't have to worry about all that. God is behind the scenes making the hats happen. But your faith will be tested because you won't see it instantly overnight. Right, Pastor. Amen, amen. Sometimes you got to wait before you see the manifestation. Are you patient? Are you patient? You're thinking about that one, aren't you? Yeah. Okay, see, Pastor preached on restoration and the haps that happened in God and I'm believing for divine intervention and providence and God's going to fix it tomorrow. What if He doesn't? You going to come in here Wednesday? It didn't happen, Pastor. No, what you do is you keep praising. You keep worshiping. You're in the house of bread and praise. You keep singing. You keep dancing. You keep running. You keep saying, let me go. Let me go. I want to go. I want to serve. I want to get in a field somewhere. Because God's going to make something happen for me. Somebody, are y'all with me? Okay. God bless you. I'm, I, I don't know. I'm expecting great things. Anybody else expecting great things? Expecting great things, bro? You got to prophesy. In the name of Jesus. Lord, you're in charge of my day. You're going to make dead things raise. You're going to make dead things live. You're going to make the helpless, hopeless situations become full of hope and full of help on purpose. Somebody say praise the Lord. How many of y'all believe God's Word today? I believe it. I believe it. Father God, in Your awesome name today, We thank You, Lord God, for Your divine providence that came to a prodigal that taught us of Your sovereignty. Lord, help us to understand as we go through life so much that happens to us, Lord, is not, it is not chance, it's not luck. It was your direction and your provision and your providence. Lord, I thank you today 
Let us be sensitive in this hour of restoration. In this hour of harvest. And everybody say with me, pray it unto the Lord, let me go into the field. In Jesus' name, God bless you. You are dismissed.